Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Forgotten Feminists. Forgotten Feminists is sponsored by The Spectator. As the longest running magazine in the world, The Spectator believes that journalism must be witty and insightful, that ideas should be discussed without the constant threat of cancellation. The Spectator never confuses the serious with the dull. It isn't right wing, it isn't left wing. It believes in challenging, informing, and entertaining readers. Since its foundation in 1828, its mission has been to convey intelligence, not ideology. Sign up today and you'll receive three free months of both the print and digital magazine, plus a free spectator hat. Just use the offer code Yasmin at checkout to redeem the special offer just for listeners of Forgotten Feminists. Thanks again. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on Forgotten Feminists today. Our guest is the amazing Wafat. Wafat is a woman who I have known for a few years and um, we've had some private chats before where I've just been amazed by her intellect and her, just the, the beauty of her soul. She's such a kind person um, and I really am excited about speaking with her today. So Wafat, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Yasmin, for having me, and thank you so much for this beautiful gathering, which I couldn't wait for it. I'm really excited for our today's conversation. I really, I'm really, I'm really so happy with it. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the beautiful uh, uh, introduction and the kind words. They really touch my heart. Really, yeah. So uh, this is Wafa Bahri <laughs> from Tunisia. Yes, Tunisia. So Tunisia is always being held up as like this beacon in the Middle East, right? I mean, that's that's a question too. Is it Middle East? Is it North Africa? But in, in the Muslim majority world, it's always being held up like, oh, you know, that's that's where they have gender equality. That's where they have democracy. That's where you can really see the true Islam. So <laughs> what do you have yeah. to say to that? What was it like yes. growing up as a woman in Tunisia? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So actually Tunisia is even uh, sometimes called in the literature, the state uh, feminist or the feminist state. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you found this terminology in the literature uh, on women's and study uh, um, about Tunisia or uh, history of Tunisia. And why is that? Well, that goes back actually to the post-independence uh, legislative uh, procedure, procedures taken by the very first uh, uh, president. Actually, I mean, uh, Tunisia just had two presidents before the revolution of 2011. Uh, the first president who came right after the uh, independence, and then uh, the second one who was outed by the Tunisian revolution. But the, the first president whose name is Bourguiba is well known, this well known name is well known for the liberator of Tunisian women. Uh, and why is that? That's because of the bunch of procedures uh, Mm, actually, they're pretty bold procedures he took right after the independence by uh, issuing the uh, code of the personal status and a number of um, uh, essential rights for women that contradict boldly uh, uh, some of the um, uh, Islamic teachings or the Islamic approach to, to feminism and women's status. Uh, since the 60s and the 70s, uh, polygamy is banned in Tunisia, for instance. Uh, there was, um, uh, he set a uh, limited uh, age uh, uh, for, for, uh, for marriage, which is uh, no uh, earlier than 18 years old. Um, uh, since uh, post independence proce procedures, uh, women uh, have the right to move uh, freely, to travel freely, uh, to open a bank account, to, to start a business without male's uh, consent or uh, males, any male's permission. Um, therapeutic uh, um, uh, uh, services uh, for the right to, uh, uh, for abortion and uh, uh, rights to uh, or accessibility to uh, contraception uh, tools everywhere in the country. Those were issued since the 60s and particularly in uh, 1973. Um, uh, and so 
it was a pretty liberal state when it comes to the women and fe women's feminism was probably if I, I can describe it or can I put it in a, in a word it's the most salient the post-colonial legacy which the government I mean opted for that's the policy it opted for uh, in order to sell an image of modernity the very first president Habib Bourguiba who's in the literature called the liberator of women uh, that's I mean he was pretty western he came back to the country with a westernized mind and um, that was his main focus is to emancipate uh, uh, Tunisian women as a matter of fact there's a very famous a video of him on YouTube when he was like roaming around the country for the first time right after he came from his exile and right after the independence and people of course he was like um, um, so very much um, appreciated by the people uh, so uh, he went around and he saw this woman who was wearing the traditional Tunisian dress which is um, uh, um, uh, sort of not hijab but a, a long mm -hmm. dress a white dress that women would would wear before growing out he went to the woman he tapped on her uh, cheek and he removed that dress and he was like you don't need this anymore and since mm -hmm. then Tunisian women are liberated and that was reinforced by a ban of hijab so hijab was banned in Tunisian public places uh, since the 1960s um, it came back to public buildings in 1981 when the Islamists uh, took over to the streets and was some uh, sort of turmoil but then it continued to be banned even with the second president all the way until uh, 2010 and 2011 with the uh, the start of the Tunisian revolution uh, which started the rest of the revolutions in the Arabic speaking countries mm -hmm. uh, the Arab Spring the literature is called Yasmin revolution but I don't like it to call it the Jasmine revolution that's not that doesn't reflect um, what the revolution is about <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I grew up in that kind of environment. Uh, I grew up with with in a family, uh, particularly with um, a dad, because my mom passed away early on in my life when I was one year and a half. So, uh, but my dad was a Borgibist. Whoever adheres by these principles are called Borgibist in affiliation to Borgiba. So he was pretty Borgibist. He was pretty um, uh, adherent to all these pro procedures. Yet he's always had a patriarchal mindset, reinforced, of course, by his uh, religious teaching. My dad identifies himself as a conservative Muslim, even though he never prayed in his life. <laughs> uh, he memorizes half of the Quran, even though I've never uh, heard him citing any Quran, but that's what he said. And uh, his, uh, when it comes to um, uh, modest culture particularly is so immersed in that culture and his justification of that was always islam islam says this so uh, that's why uh, you should be dressed up like this even though he's all the time uh, like against hijab my dad calls hijab the women and i'm gonna quote unquote because this is gonna sound pretty racist he's always called them like liars he was like to be religious you don't need that symbol uh, or to show off your religiosity that's how he grew up however uh, he's so very much uh, it was pretty much violent against women, particularly his wives, not his daughters. Uh, and he justifies that by Quran, uh, ayah or verse 34 in Anisa, uh, chapter Anisa. And uh, at the same time, when it comes to the way women should dress up i mean there is a lot of policing uh which for which i mean i rebelled i was i, I was always against that uh, but of course i didn't have the means uh to execute my my my, my uh my thoughts on that until i i came to the united states uh, mm -hmm. so yeah so this is this is how I, I i grew up this is the political and the family environment where i grew up yeah so it sounds like an interesting paradox really where it's it's a liberal feminist forward thinking in many ways but at the same time it's like the islamic patriarchal edicts are almost like a weight like they're going to constantly be pulling things back you know for your dad to be able to refer to the quran and say this is why i can beat my wives you know yes um even some of the things that you mentioned like the fact that uh, polygamy was um was made illegal you know like how can they do that islamically it's it's allowed and so how can you make something you know what is it they say, how can a human make something haram that allah has made halal you know yes so it's just this constant i guess you're in a state of um 
yeah, I guess paradox. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, actually, yeah. So actually, Tunisians are cruel themselves it's because of this paradox they grew up in, the political and social paradox, schizophrenic. They always, yes. like, if, they, if they do any auto autocritic, they would consider, we're, we're, by the end of the day, we're schizophrenic. We don't mm. know whether they're religious or irreligious. We don't know whether okay. we're Muslims, but we are, like, we adopt a Western system in our country. So it's, yeah, I mean, this is how the Tunisian mindset has been always structured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. tell me about when you came to the U.S. Um, how was it as a Muslim woman coming into the United States, um, going to the mosques in the U.S. and you know how, how what yeah. was what was that like? Did you find? Yeah. Yeah, so um, because I grew up in this liberal environment slash patriarchal at the same time, uh, when it comes to Islam, I've always had um, some passion about Islam, even though I didn't, I mean, I didn't understand. I mean, I understood that I didn't understand Islam only after I left it. But before that, I was like, I was so apologetic. I'm, I'm like the number one apologist, even though I didn't understand or I could not explain it clearly. Um, and it meant something to me. It meant very important layer in my identity on, on in what identifies Wafa as Wafa. When I came to the United States, the only thing I was concerned about was my religiosity. Mm. I mean, because I'm coming to a Western country, the Western world is known for being quite distanced from, from religion, from practicing religion. So I have to protect that. That should be a very important uh, uh, important um, uh, definition of who I am and I have to sell it very well and keep selling it very well to the West so that they accept Islam and uh, they accept the true image of the peaceful Islam. Even though every apologist thinks that they are the true uh, image of the peaceful Islam. Yeah. Uh, so um, I prayed more. I didn't, I didn't used to pray in Tunisia as much as I prayed in the United States. I never went to a mosque in Tunisia. Very, very very occasionally during Ramadan, the fasting month, uh, and that was only when I when I lived in the capital in Tunis. Uh, otherwise, I've never wanted to any mosque. But when it came to the United States, that became this constant practice for me. I have to go to a mosque every Friday, and I have to go to a mosque every Ramadan. And my favorite uh, prayers were the longest prayers in, Ram in Ramadan at Tarawih. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh! I loved them so much, and I never missed missed a single prayer wow. <laughs> i mean yeah i loved it and and i, I tried and I, of course i never put on on hijab and i've always argued against it uh and i was always like oh no quran didn't say that women should be hijabi but actually it did it did actually and it did police women's body but i came to this understanding very late very very late so I argued against it, uh, but I would like cook for the for the um, uh, for the people who pray at the mosque on every Friday. Uh, at the time, I was uh, dating my my boyfriend, who's Indian, and uh, he's Indian Hindu, and he was very peaceful. I was like, he, I would cook, and he would carry the food with me to the mosque. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I pushed so him to carry the food with me. <laughs> yeah, to, to so you continued food. your paradoxical <laughs> mindset into America, yeah, and, where you come in with I, your non-Muslim yeah. boyfriend to the mosque. <laughs> exactly. And I, I, I never did this before in Tunis, never cared yeah. really. Uh, and and I, I even tried to convert him and I was like, okay, if you convert to Islam, you're going to become like a baby, a new baby born. All your mm. sins is going to be like eradicated. And I was like, but how do you know I have sins? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why are you dating me if I've sinned? Yeah, why are you assuming this? Oh yeah. my gosh, I think that's so interesting that you brought that up because people are so surprised when they hear my story because they're like, you're in Canada, you're in Canada. But there's something about being in the Western world, being in, in, a, in a liberal society that makes people clamp down on their religion even more than they do in Muslim majority countries. I mean, I never felt more free than when I went to Egypt, to be honest. Then it was, oh, people were belly dancing and listening to music, like my cousins, like my family. I couldn't believe it. All of the stuff was completely forbidden when I was in Canada. In the Islamic schools, you know, all we ever did was pray. Um, and then now the, the, the schools there, because I was teaching at a school in, in Egypt, it was just it was so much more open. It was so much more free. There was discussions going on, like the kinds of things that I was not used to in Canada at all. So it's, it, yeah, it's quite interesting how people assume that you're going to be more conservative when you're coming from the Muslim majority world, but quite often um, 
its people in the in the Western world, they just I think that they want to they want to resist or they want to um, yes. defend their identity or something. That's, that's for me. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I think for for my family, they really wanted to put up like a huge brick wall separating us from the society so that we wouldn't pick up any of these, you know, feminism, liberalism, democracy, any of these evil ideas, you know. Yes, yes. That was that was my concern, by the way. It was like a tool of resistance. I have to practice Islam as long as I'm in America to protect that identity, which I was aware somehow that was not uh, well prepared propagated like somehow so I have to protect it I have to put to be apologist and I have to sell the best of it I have to demonstrate the best of it mm -hmm. and uh, however I mean unfortunately like as much as I was passionate about the practice uh, and because I started going to the mosque and even the dawa uh, table students you know in mm. every university there were dawa table they tried to pull me but I resisted that as well I was like that's mm. wrong I don't know why I was wrong but I resisted that I mean mm. they tried I was like you can come to our dawa and can sit there and uh, distribute brochures or whatever. And I was, I didn't, I didn't, they didn't sit well with me. And they tried so hard with me yeah. because my roommate who was Tunisian, she, she was a pretty Islamist and she, she tried with me as well because she worked with them. And, and it was like, she was, she was like all the time, Wafa, you're a nice person. You love Islam. You're very passionate. Why don't you come with us? We should preach this. It was pretty, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I feel something fishy about it, but I don't know why. But at the same time, when I go to the mosque, I have my own corner uh, and I, I start like towards, uh, towards like uh, after three, four, particularly when I moved to New York from, the, I lived in Virginia, then you moved to New York for my PhD. In New York, I started thinking like, um, I started feeling something uncomfortable, but uh, um, the way I, you, I used, I mean, to go to the mosque is like, I would sit separately from everybody else. And then I was like, okay. Uh, and I started to become aware of the feminist question. And I was like, okay, I have to, I have to say to people that Islam is feminist as well. Mm -hmm. It's another thing that I have to add. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna pray in the men's section. So I started mm. praying in the men's section and I was waiting for the imam. Um, I tried to become provocative for the imam to criticize me or to push me, to, to ask me to go to the women's section. They never did that, to be honest. I started to pray on my, without hijab, without covering my head. The women came to me, oh, you have to cover, you have to cover your head. You have to cover your hands. You have to cover, you have to wear socks. And I started pushing back against that. I mean, peacefully in the beginning, but then when they exaggerated, it was, I mean, it got exaggerated at a certain point and this happened particularly in Ramadan and I'm like okay mind your businesses I mean I'm not gonna do this so I pray on stretchy jeans on shorts no not covering my hair I was like if Islam is about like just what's in your heart so you don't care about I mean mm -hmm. the, the surface you should not care about what, how, how you should dress up in a mosque or out, in or outside the mosque it doesn't matter because you're a Muslim all the time right it's about Nia it's about the intuition <laughs> Yeah, and then, uh, but then, but then, uh, and the more I stay in the mosque, the more I, I do not see Islam, the more mm -hmm. that which I picture, which I envision, and it mm -hmm. start and then there was the ISIS at the same time, which, which happened during that time, 2012, 2013, etc. And um, so, and uh, um, I mean, I started questioning uh, honestly, like. Um, because most, of, I don't know, I, I feel like these women, uh, they're privileged somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I mean, I don't feel like they are, they have Iman, they have faith as much as they show enough. And as much as they are using an identity uh, as it, I, I couldn't call it political at that time. I didn't have that expression in my mind. But it's like, for me, it's like a tool to an end rather than something we do really have faith in or they believe in. Mm -hmm. um, I started questioning, uh, justice at the same time, God's justice. Like, I, I mean, I became much more aware of the inequality that's happening in the world. And I'm like, okay, if this is an omnipresent God and he's so merciful, why, why there is a lot of sufferings? And particularly, I mean, this question is triggered by the incidents in Syria and Iraq. He is um, it women? Yes, it you women, the children, um, and, uh, um, and and then and then there was a fight I told you about that happened in the mosque and that was a deal breaker. It was Ramadan time. I went as usual to the mosque. I, I take the train, you know. I have to mm -hmm. exhaust myself to go pray the taraweeh at night. You have to you know, suffer. What, what, the more you suffer, the more you get rewards. Yes, yes that was yeah. my. <laughs> 
crashed. I take the train, I go to the mosque, and uh, I mean, there was this mid-Ramadan, and then there was this intermission between, because the prayers are long, intermission between the prayers, um, and the imam would be like, um, between in the intermission would have a khutbah or a speech and teach something about Islam. And I wanted to hear that all the time. But there was, I mean, during that intermission, the women start gossiping and noise and, and eating food, kids jumping, and it's like a mess. Every single mosque, by the way, this is not the case yeah. of one mosque. Every mm -hmm. single mosque in New York and in Virginia, it's mm -hmm. messed up. So I intervened that's, as, uh, at what time. I was like, okay, would you please be quiet? I want to hear what the guy is saying. I mean, and a woman came to me and I was like, uh, uh, well, if, if, if you're really serious about religiosity and about wanting to hear the guy, you wouldn't have pulled nail, uh, put nail polish. I had nail polish. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is none of your business. So she, she wanted to grab my hair because I told her this is none of your business. Mm -hmm. And the fight was about to start, a violent fight. So it was interrupted. I just grabbed my stuff and left. And since then, I never went to a mosque. The following day, I work in a lab at my school, a language lab at my school. And I had um, a friend who's from Jordan. Uh, she, she's Muslim. She's always Muslim, but she's very critical of Islam. And she opened my eyes on so many things like Malikat al Yamin, the sex, mm. uh, sex slaves. I didn't know. She told me about it. She's Muslim and she's still Muslim, by the way. She told mm. me that there are, there are sex slaves and mentioned more than 20 times in Quran. I was like, no, you're kidding me. It's not mm -hmm. true. And she was like, yeah, that's true. Uh, she wears hijab whenever she goes back to Jordan. She was like, I don't care, I have to be safe. Uh, she's forced into hijab whenever she, she, she goes back to Jordan. So it was Ramadan again, the following day, like I told you. And she was like working with me. And then she looked at me and she was like, do you feel like to have a coffee? It was 10 a.m. in the morning. And I was like, damn, yes, I feel like to have a coffee. <laughs> That was the first time ever I went out and I broke my the first time in my life. And we had the coffee from Starbucks next, I mean, next in the corner of, of my of my university by the Empire State Building, by the way, in New York. Yeah. So, uh, and we had the coffee and she she carried on to be to identify herself as a Muslim, by the way. But I know that deep heart, she's not. And because she's mm -hmm. the one who's criticized, who opened my eyes on many things. Um, I was on Facebook during that same period and um, I saw Ilan's body on the shores of Turkish, the mm -hmm. Kurdish island, the little mm -hmm. guy. And that's when I decided I come out. I just wrote the status. I'm done with this. I'm done with this. Mm -hmm. On that day, I received so many messages from close friends to me, from my hometown, particularly in Tunisia. They were like, Wafa, you're being blasphemous. Be careful. Be careful. And I was like, I am blasphemous, actually. Mm -hmm. I am blasphemous on Facebook. And, mm. and and that's how, how I interrupted. And it's a very emotional moment when I saw that body, I was like, that's it, done. Right. Wow. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's incredibly brave, incredibly brave for you to do yeah, that. Yeah, that was September 2015. Yeah, I mean, I, I for me, it was 9-11 it was that did it for me. It was, it was such an emotional, and at the same time, I was also, I also had an intellectual, because I was in university and I was taking history of religions course. And so that was already bombarding my mind, but then 9-11 happened and then that just bombards your heart as well. And then that's it, like that, I'm done. I can't, I'm, I'm finished with this. But I stayed quiet. I stayed very quiet for like 15 years. I didn't say a word. So, I mean, the fact that you could, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. I don't know anybody else who did that, who just like came out so publicly um, oh, yeah. because the backlash would have been immense, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's because social media like allows people to attack you in so many more ways, like, like than than real life. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like there's no point in real life when you're going to have 300 people screaming at you telling you how much they hate you and how you're going to burn in hell and how you're this and that you know what I mean but oh yeah yeah well not for someone like you or me like maybe for a politician or something like that but but Facebook just give it's it's such a cesspool of hate you know so I, I can't even imagine the strength of character that it would have took for you to to write that post knowing all of the people that could read it and, and how they could react. So, I mean, yeah. that's... 
Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I mean, I took it very personal when I saw that picture, of course, uh, just like trembled, every sh like shook everybody else. Whoever yeah. saw a land's body on the shore, Turkish shores, I don't think there is a single person who did not, was not shaken, I mean, shaken by yeah. that image. And to me, that was very, very personal. It's like, again, the justice, the God's justice question has been answered to me at that moment. That is mm. no, it's impossible that this God exists. Impossible. I wow. mean, uh, seeing and watching the uh, the ordeal of, of, of these children, of the Syrian, Iraqi children, Kurdish children, Yazidi children, like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I, everybody was like, I know that it took me a moment to um, imagine, I mean, the struggle of islands in particular in the ocean. I was like, how, how did, and when he fell out of the boat, like, how was mm -hmm. that, how did mm -hmm. that feel? Like, how? Like, how was he? How did he, what did he do? What did he think of? What, I don't know. So mm -hmm. many questions. And I just come out, I came out, I mean, and I was like, I'm done. And, and yes, and then if ever, uh, people was like, you're blaspheming. Private text message, I mean, messages. And the, some people just commented, you're being blasphemed. Be careful. That's not what, what all this is about. And I was like, no, I am blaspheming. And I mm -hmm. assume it. Wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, it was it was really, really tough. That was really, really tough. But then you feel alone, you ask me, because oh, everybody gosh. is against you. Oh, and you yes. didn't know about anything you did that, right? Because mm -hmm. it was, you know, when you're, it's not it's not like a very common thing to be an apostate, right? Apostate mm -hmm. should be killed, right? So nobody yeah. dares or even to it. think about it. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, I was the only one in the world. Yes, like, me is. too. <laughs> Yeah, it is such a deep loneliness. Like you feel so isolated. You, it's it's so hard to explain to someone what that feels like. And I mean, and when I decided I didn't want to be Muslim anymore, it was before social media too. So I truly like I'd never heard the term ex-Muslim. I didn't even know other people existed like me. I thought that it. it if there were other people who decided that they didn't want to be Muslims anymore, they were already killed, you know? Yeah. They, they're not alive. I'm never going to hear their voice. I'm never going to see them. So I better stay quiet so that nobody knows that I exist. And that's why I was quiet for so long. Um, so yeah, yep. the, the loneliness and the, the not just the loneliness from like outside world too, but you feel such a sense of loss too, because your entire life was was like on this path and you you had all the answers and you knew what you were doing and you and you have sort of a an idea of who Wafat is and what she believes and what's her identity and then and now what now it's like this like you're just there you're just standing with like rubble around you saying I have yeah. to re I have to rebuild this woman somehow like from you know it, it's it's such a it's such a personal journey it's such a difficult journey and, it, yeah. and you have to do it all alone like it's so scary yeah absolutely I remember I remember I was at the university cafeteria uh, at the graduate center cafeteria and eating my lunch lonely and I was like what did I do to myself I was wondering and then I had my laptop with me and I was like let me let me look like uh, uh, for apostates or people who leave Islam or whatever and the word ex-Muslim came up for the first time and then ex-Muslim organization came up and I was like like I, I, re I remember that moment will never be like the, the the timing the frame or the 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 setting it was the cafeteria eighth floor graduate center and i am like eating my lunch and my lot i stopped my lunch i was like what's this ex-muslim mean what does it mean seriously and i searched and i was like oh there's an organization and then there's contact information i was like okay let me reach out just mm -hmm. reach out and i just sh shoot an email maybe three or four or four sentences that the man I introduced myself i was like i left islam what should i do now <laughs> <laughs> Please help. Can I join you? <laughs> Can I join oh, yeah. you? How to join you? What are you doing? What do you do? What's your work? I don't know. But they reached out and then they invited me. And when they invited me, it was so exciting. And and uh, and when they when they made me join their Facebook, like they accepted me in their Facebook, and I found the list of ex Muslims, the list of the, and I was like, it was such a relief for me yeah. and such a new fora that happened like oh, oh my gosh there are all yeah. these people are here yeah <laughs> it was really and, and the first i mean 
I can't be thankful enough to Apes Muslim in North America, to be honest. Yeah, I remember that feeling as well. I they felt filled like, up a gap. Yeah. It's like you feel it's like you found your new umma, you know. <laughs> it's like you did you lost this community, but you have a new one. Like you really feel like you're it's like oxygen for the first time since leaving Islam. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I became addicted on their Facebook uh, group page and, and their work and I love them, I appreciate them and still do. I mean, I appreciate them because they filled up a huge gap in my life, mm-hmm. literally. They, they've had like very positive impact. I feel like they gave me a push to carry on because at a certain moment, you know, PhD mm-hmm. is so hard and I'm a non-native speaker dealing with so tough stuff. I mean, I'm, I was, I remember I was like taking semantics. I failed semantics. I hate semantics in linguistics. And I was like, I was like dealing with so much at that time. And then they came in, I mean, literally they gave me a push like yeah. whenever i mean i'm stuck at something i go on their facebook that's what i do i just go on their on the group yeah. page and follow and read the comments and it's yeah. a support group it's like alcoholics anonymous or something they are. yeah they are. so how do you think that would have been for you if you were in tunisia like do you think that it how, how different would the experience have been if you were on your facebook page saw that image and wrote that post when you were still at home i think i mean of course uh, i'm not sure if i would have done it that earlier and that boldly uh, mm. for sure even though uh, why is that because the islamists took over after the revolution mm-hmm. and the general atmosphere in the country kind of changed and switched backward all right and i mean even i mean women's rights they just were like uh, they i mean they were threatened uh, so much particularly the uh, code of the social status the islamists proposed to uh, change it uh, to change for instance the polygamy law they were like that's an islamic we have to get rid of that uh, they proposed so many other um, other i mean they came up with so many proposals against the code of social status even though the code of social uh, personal status sorry uh, doesn't really fulfill everything that's feminist i mean there are i mean did not for instance fill up the gap of the the economic equality or the inherit uh, equal inheritance for instance that was like and negotiable, I mean, whatever in Tunis, that because that's haram, it's Islamic. So I don't think I would have done it that boldly. However, um, I have to admit that, um, in the, I mean, uh, with the appearance of the Islamists, there is another group that emerged to push back. Uh, and in, uh, their argument was like, we need to protect whatever we've achieved so far, even if we cannot like progress further, but at least we have to keep whatever we've achieved so far in terms of the um, uh, um, um, equality, okay? The, you know, the, in terms of uh, equal laws, in terms of women's the women's status in the country, so people kept uh, pushing against that, and I joined that group. I, I joined that group, but at the same time, there were a couple of people, uh, not in Tunis but in Egypt, uh, who uh, emerged after the uh, rev- after the revolution, and they made it to the media, to the public media. And the people in Tunis who have some kind of free mindsets, kind of like liked them and admired them. I'm speaking here of, for instance, Ahmed Harqan and Shirin mm-hmm. Jaber and uh, Ismail Muhammad. Open atheists. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those helped a group of Tunis like to just follow them, myself included, follow their discourse, follow their whatever um, they put out there. And uh, um, and people discuss behind the, the, the curtains, behind the, the, the table, under the tables, like uh, uh, the potentials of, of living the ideology and the potentials of understanding ideology with well, the, that ideology uh, the internet of course uh, helped it tremendously because people did not need any more a sheikh or an intermediator to explain to them what's in Quran what's in hadith uh, what's in the uh, Islamic legacy in general now we can go just online and search ourselves and discuss it between us and that's helped helped tremendously yeah. so uh, I mean uh, but uh, knowing who I am, I think that at a later stage, I would have done it. I would have come out and said, said look, I'm, I'm not, because nowadays, like, I'm a public, I'm open and open, uh, religious, uh, 
Tunisian women, um, even members of my family knew of it, uh, and some of them they do not approve it, but I, I don't really care so much. Uh, but I'm public to everyone, and even I'm, I'm like I'm a member of an association which is the Irreligious Associations of Tunisians, and that's Inara. And this mm -hmm. works like it's a legal association. And I'm openly a member of that association, and we work like uh, openly, ever and publicly, um, everywhere in the country. So, yeah. So I want to go back to something that you mentioned there, which is that now that internet is available, so people don't need to go through the imam as the intermediary. They can just read the Quran themselves. They can read the hadith themselves. They can be horrified <laughs> sitting there with their laptops, being like, "Oh my God, I had no idea it was this vicious." Um, so many people ask me all the time, do you think that this Muslim reform is happening? Do you think that minds are actually opening up in the Middle East and in the Muslim world? And I truly believe that the answer is yes. And it's because of the internet. It's because people can, they're, they're not just being told what they're told in school or in media and, or whatever's being fed propaganda is being fed to them, now they can go online and they can read everything and they can know everything. They can hear so many different perspectives and make up their own mind, um, which kind of brings me to your work with the Richard Dawkins Foundation, the Translations Project, because his book, The God Delusion, I mean, I don't even know if you know the numbers off the top of your head, but I heard it before. It was some like astronomical times that it's been downloaded and that people have read it in the Middle East, like reading like the Arabic translations of it, um, the Urdu translations, the Indonesian translations, the, the Farsi translations. I mean, people all over the Muslim majority world are, are thirsty, thirsty for this knowledge, thirsty for these different narratives. And, and, and I feel like well, it did feel like this for me when I was reading his books and, and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris's books. It felt like things finally made sense. I've read the Quran so many times, cover to cover, and it never made sense. And now here I am reading this book and I'm like, yes, of course, two plus two is four, you know? And so it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to, to unravel everything once you... Um, give people the opportunity to, to, to discover other narratives, other ideas, other perspectives, you know. I've lived in a Sharia bubble in Canada. I wasn't in a Muslim majority country, but you can just imagine in countries like, you know, you're mentioning Egypt, 90% of the population is Muslim. Um, yeah. Your Islam is so seeped, embedded into every single aspect of your life. And so it's almost impossible to have these um, experiences like you were describing with your friend from Jordan saying like, let's go for a coffee and on a Ramadan morning and stuff like you can't do that if you're living in a Muslim majority country, right? So yep. the internet is really their only uh, conduit to sanity, I guess. Absolutely, I agree. As a matter of fact, there is a very impressive underground movement ongoing right now in Clubhouse. And mm -hmm. the uh, consequences of this movement among Arabic speaking um, um, uh, Arab countries, and particularly Muslims in Arabic speaking countries, it's really impressive. As a matter of fact, we are um, uh, getting ready for the first digital Arabic speaking uh, protest. Uh, or protests of Arab-speaking atheists, and that's happening on the 21st uh, of February. And uh, it's a huge protest that's growing everywhere in the world. We are saying we are here as mm -hmm. uh, Arab-speaking atheists, and the hashtag is uh, 2020 Fab 2020 as a pushback against the monotheist and uh, the, uh, the triple deist religion. So we picked mm -hmm. up number two. 2025, 2020. Uh -huh. uh, so please join us in this protest. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is that? That's as a result. This coming up as a result of the 
internet, uh, the internet support and the, the accessibility to the internet. Like you said, people know they no longer need an intermediator to understand the Islamic uh, legacy. Uh, and of course, the grad delusion, which continues to be leading in the rate of downloading as per the last data of the um, uh, of the translations project by, uh, I mean, uh, at uh, RDF, the, uh, the RDF, uh, Richard Dawkins Foundations, uh, it's read, I mean, it continues to be read and to be downloaded, the first book, even though we are like translating new books and making new releases every quarter, but uh, uh, yeah, it continues to be leading uh, and it has like, it changed or it shook uh, the Arabic Muslim world, I mean, um, shook its roots, by the way, mm -hmm. whoever mm -hmm. discovered that book, even though, by the way, people are criticizing it right now, like the all these religious people who left, they were like, it's not my, our best book. Mm. But it's not the best book I've ever read, and they have their own critiques and everything. Uh, but uh, it's still an eye opener for yeah. for everyone uh, who wants to uh, see from the other side of the mm -hmm. of the uh, or, or a different perspective to religion. So yes, it has it has like it has had huge huge uh, impact among Arab speaking uh, atheists and in Muslim majority countries in, in in general. That's that's absolutely uh, true. And like I said, it is uh, it is one of the factors that has enhanced or pushed uh, these. Um, underground movements uh, um, uh, to come up and to keep like uh, working or like I said right now uh, there is a, a huge feminist movement among Arabic speaking uh, mm -hmm. uh, atheists um, I mean for instance it is the first time ever like this movement has participated in no hijab day I told you mm -hmm. that yes I mean I showed mm -hmm. you some some mm -hmm. data and they are and since then since then they were and they're planning already they have been already planning for what to do next year they want to release something written like your book or a, a volume of essays. Uh, they want to um, join. In, they want to join the uh, public media. I mean, with open faces. Uh, and they were like, well, "No, we're going to take it to the streets." Actually, in Germany, in France. And as a matter of fact, I mean, the ex-Muslims of um, Germany. They were inspired by the clubhouse uh, feminist movement on the No Hijab Day, and they took it to the street. They went mm -hmm. to the street and they lifted like flyers and everything with no hijab day on on the on the first of February. That oh, happened. I that was it. and that was inspired by Arabic speaking feminists. Trust mm -hmm. me on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. no, that is that is the world is a change and every day nowadays they're criticizing like you would find this room of 300, 400 people and they're all like criticizing a question, bringing up a question, I mean a religious question and talking about it, discussing it, criticizing it uh, and the minds are changing and the people mm -hmm. are changing and they're like opening their minds and everybody like, like now is like using the critical thinking uh, skills because you know we grew up in countries where critical Doesn't thinking exist. is banned. Mm -hmm. from school, from whatever system, the social, mm -hmm. the political, the educational system, we don't think critically. And that's, I mean, one of my major, um, if, I, if I may say, like, uh, uh, difficulties I faced when I moved to the United States. I didn't have that skill. Mm -hmm. I had to start from scratch to learn it, right? Nowadays, everybody's subscribing to that skill. Everybody's knowing and value, I mean, valuing it. And everybody is like approaching that there is nothing that's called mm -hmm. sacred. They're challenging the word sacred and holy. I mean, in every single, uh, every single discussion that, that they bring either in Clubhouse or Facebook or social media, it's like, we don't, we're not going to subscribe to anything that's sacred anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want to change our countries. We want to change our, our, uh, I mean, situation because we're so far behind, we're like 14 centuries behind everybody else and it's a shame. Yeah. And these people, I mean, you're going to be so impressed by their intellect. Oh yeah. my gosh. I mean, really one time am. I made a state on Facebook, I was like, please, political leaders, just step aside, let these people yes. leave. I'm sure that yes. they're going to do something. They're going to change yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I just, uh, there's so many things I want to say in response to that, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time. So I really want to ask you one more question um, before we open it up to everybody who's here. I want to talk to you. So this is really what you just talked about now is, is so inspiring and it's such, it's so positive. And I want to continue on that note and also ask you about um, imperialism, because when we talk about uh, imperialism, we're always talking about, oh, those, you know, those bad white people and how they are imperialists. So my, so in Egypt, where my family is from, which is in North Africa, 
they actually, the official name of Egypt is now the Arab Republic of Egypt. We have nothing to do with Arabs, but now we're called the Arab Republic of Egypt. We speak yeah. Arabic. We have no respect for our pre-Islamic um, civilization, the ancient Egyptian civilization that everybody in the West values. In Egypt, it's not valued. It's considered the Jahiliya, the the days of ignorance, the pre-Islamic days of ignorance that they almost are ashamed of. Yeah. Um, so, so many countries have been colonized by Arabs and their identities have been erased and they've been forced, you know, you talked about the uh, Tunisian traditional clothing that gets replaced with hijab, if not niqab. And you see that happening all over the world. You see that happening right now in, in Afghanistan, very visibly. Um, so I just want you to talk a little bit about your Amazigh culture and that whole awakening too, because that's another sort of pushback and, and, and reclaiming of, of your true identity. Yeah, so I was, as I was leaving Islam, and I was like, um, uh, uh, I uh, I was working on my PhD, taking courses, but I haven't decided yet my research topic, and I was like struggling with what to do for my research topic, and then uh, it was all accidental, it came up during Christmas dinner, because I have an uncle who uh, used to live in Atlanta, he's married an American, and there was a Christmas dinner, and I was like, we were discussing my future um, projects and what I'm gonna search or focus on for my research. And then my uncle was like, why don't you search the Berber element in Tunisia? And I was mm. like, oh, that's, that's a dead language. I'm not gonna mm. find data. I don't wanna struggle. And he was like, but your grandma uses Berber terms. And I was like, what? That was a shock from him. Like, what terms? And I mean, to me, because I grew up in the city, my grandma is from the rural, and I understand that we speak two different varieties of Tunisian, two different regional varieties, but it has never occurred to me that the rural variety is highly influenced by Tamazight language. And and that was like a shocking mo a ha an aha moment for me. I was like, mm. but how can I find data? How can I, I was like, use your grandma, record your grandma and analyze her data. My grandma is like a hundred years old at the time, you know, mm -hmm. so very old, yeah. So, and as I went online, I was like, and I, so again, I went online and I searched the Amazigh people in Tunisia, and to my surprise, for the first time, I found out that actually there are speakers in the southern parts in Tunisia, and to be precise, for those who do not know Tunisia, these are, I'm talking about the um, regional uh, parts of the country where Star Wars was made. <laughs> yeah, where, where Star Wars were filmed. This is what I'm talking about. It was filmed in the Amazigh uh, zone of Tunisia. And as a matter of fact, there was a planet in the movie which is called Tatwin. Tatwin is an Amazigh world and it's a name of a city in Tunisia. Oh, how cool. I didn't know and that. I love to it. Bring the picture closer to whoever yeah. doesn't I mean, audience whoever doesn't know what I'm talking about I found speakers on Facebook and I was so impressed so do you do exist and they're young in Asia they were like in 30s and, and their 30s and 20s and I was so you do exist I mean how come I never <laughs> want to know I mean and never, because the way they depict them as an element is like an, an eradicate it did exist in history but it's ex extinct it's um it's dead and it's almost a taboo word, particularly before the revolution. Why is that? Because it was deemed separatist, and whoever bring that narrative, and I came to know all this after my, my research, by the way. Uh, whoever bring the Amazigh narrative who wants to talk about Tamazigh, the uh, Tamazigh element or the Amazigh element in Tunis, they're deemed separatist and divisive and uh, harmful to the political uh, hegemony, uh, sorry, uh, homogeneity of the country uh, and this, this is the hegemony of the socio-political i mean um, uh, an arab islamic ideology mm -hmm. in the country so since we were born we're told we're arabs and mm -hmm. it took me like an, uh, about three decades of my life before i discovered that i've never been arab neither yeah. culturally uh, nor linguistically because i speak etunsi which is highly influenced by tamazigh language i mean plenty plenty of lexicon lexical terms and even the morphology of tunsi and so is moroccan and so is algerian those mm. are tamazigh yes. those came from tamazigh language all right mm -hmm. uh culturally i mean we eat couscous that's our main dish couscous mm -hmm. is a tamazigh dish mm -hmm. but they introduced to us an arabic dish 
Mm -hmm. The structure of our architecture, it's all like in, in uh, the, particularly the castles where, particularly in the southern parts of Tunis, those are Tamazir structures, Tamazir architecture, they introduced to us as Tamazir. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the cattle, like the horses, we're speaking about an Arab horse, while all the horses in Tunis are Berber horse. We're speaking about, I mean, everything yeah, is yeah. Arabized yes. under the Arabization mm -hmm. uh, policy and pla planning which suffocated to death our identity or at least a very important element of a Tunisian identity and so is the case in other North African countries yeah. for the sake of um, the Islamic, Arab Islamic identity and homogeneous, pseudo homogeneous Arab Islamic identity basically a lie and that's why we've grown up like earlier I spoke about schizophrenia I understand mm. that we have an identity crisis we don't know who we are we don't identify ourselves by who we are actually mm -hmm. and that's so hurtful to me I took that very personally Personally. And and since then, I mean, since I started searching the Amazigh history, the, of course, my, my focus is in, in the linguistics part, a part of, of Tamazigh language. I mean, I mean, every day I'm, I'm disclosing plenty of plenty of of data and information that are contradictory to uh, to Arab identity and particularly to the Islamic identity. I mean, by the end of the day, the word Amazigh itself etymologically means the free man or free human being. Mm. And symbolically, it's, I mean, symbolically, it's, I mean, they take, um, I mean, it has a script, it's called Tifinach, the Mesir has an ancient script called Tifinach, then they um, innovated, and now we're using Neo Tifinach, um, has specific, um, and like, like, uses characters, uh, uh, yeah, some sort of characters, uh, but in these characters, there is the character which is, stands for the letter Yaz or Z. Yes, the, the Yaz is a particular, uh, basically is like a symbol of a free a human being because the way you design it is like a human being opening their uh, arms upward and mm. they're setting their legs freely to symbolize the idea of freedom. When it comes to religion, I mean, I read the book by Martin Kruzman, who's a linguist and a Berberist. He focuses on Berber studies and Amazigh studies. I mean, he did a lot of research on, on the etymology of the language. And he claims that even the term uh, or uh, Amazigh, they don't have a term for Ubudiyah, for slavery, mm. uh, the way Arabs had. And this mm -hmm. is normal. I mean, languages, we don't have, each language has its own lexicon mm -hmm. and some languages do not have the same concepts uh, mm -hmm. as other language we conceptualize things different it's not it's something that you use yeah yes yeah so i mean even uh, and this speech i mean when i when i compare this information or when i take this linguistic information and see history i know that in ibn khaldun the sociologist the famous sociologist he he uh, um, uh, he, he said that amazigh people revolted against islam 12 times they apostated 12 times the queen of the Amazigh people was a woman because Islam is against women being leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazigh was led by a woman whose his name is Dihya, but the, the Arabs called it Kahina or, or uh, you know, the witch uh, as an insult, right? Because she's mm -hmm. a woman and leading her country and she fought against Islam to a point and never, never surrendered uh, and she chose like death she was killed by by the muslims invaders uh, uh, uh over surrendering uh, and by the end when she was about to when she knew that she was she's gonna be like defeated this is what she said to the muslims and this is very known in the literature okay you have a message of islam you claim it's peaceful give us the message and go back to your own friends why are you staying why are you staying here? But if you if you came with good like with a good mm. um, intention and it's just to preach this ideology, would give it to us. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna carry on preaching it and go back to your own friends. Why are you colonizing us? Why are you staying? Amazigh people paid men paid the the ransoms like hell. Amr ibn al As, the Sahabi, the the prophet's friend or companion, whatever who colonized Egypt and sent his uh, men to colonize North Africa. You know what he did to the Amazigh people? He was like, if you're not able, because at the, the Amazigh people of Libya, uh, there is a portion that's tribe in Libya, they were not able to pay the ransom because of uh, poverty. I mean, they were drained. Their land was drained mm -hmm. by Muslims, by the Muslim invaders. He was like, if you can't pay the ransom, sell your kids yeah. to pay for the ransom. And this is documented in the literature. And this is mm -hmm. in the literature. When I see all these information, I was like, 
what the Arab Islamic ideology just that did to us, what mm -hmm. Arabization policy just did to us. Like it has erased, erased our identity, it has suffocated us and suppressed us. And how mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be able, I'm not gonna be angry against this. I mean, I have yeah. every single right to be angry against falsifying my history, my indigenous history and falsifying all this. Um, uh, and I have every single reason to name the spade the spade and that is Islam. This is what Islam did to know. North Africa. Yes, girl. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. And that's this what they've done to right like. Now, yes, I mean, I'm working day, day in and day out on revitalizing this culture and revitalizing and reconstructing this identity, making people reconcile with this identity. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that whoever is from North African and they identify themselves as a religious or atheist, they're more likely to identify themselves yes. as Amazigh. Yes. more likely <laughs> yes yeah yeah for sure yeah um or berber or you know um phoenician or you know what i mean like they're always trying they want to they go back to their pre-islamic identity who they were before they were colonized and their culture was was stolen from them and and, and mm -hmm. you know uh, all of that violence and destruction um and that's happened i mean that's been repeated in what like close to 50 countries around the world. So yeah. it's a common yeah. story, So it's, it's a colonial religion. Let's name it as it is. I call yeah. it colonial religion. And yeah. otherwise, and if we didn't deal with colonialism, because everybody is like oh, crying about the, uh, the European colonialism that existed. But let's name every colonialism colonialism and yeah. be honest about the narratives. It yeah. is a colonial religion, and we are colonized nowadays. We're standardizing the Tunisia as a response or, or against uh, this falsification of identity. The Tunisia nowadays we have an association that I, I work with to standardize the Tunisia. It's my mother tongue, and Arabic mm -hmm. is not my mother tongue. It's my mm -hmm. second language. Or at least I grew up bilingual because I heard some standard Arabic in, in cartoons or whatever. So that yeah made me a little bit bilingual in standard Arabic. But it's not the mother tongue. Actually, Arabic is not the mother tongue of any single human being still living on earth. None. It's not the mother mother linguistically speaking, it is the second language because you wait until you go to school to learn it. I'm speaking about standard Arabic. The mm -hmm. mother tongues we speak are languages highly influenced lexically by Arabic, uh, maybe phonologically and morphologically by Arabic, but also there are plenty of other layers. Uh, that added to these languages, uh, of which there is Tamazigh, and there is Spanish, and there is French, and Italian, and so many other langu and languages. So that's why our languages, I mean, they, what they call Arabic dialects, and that's another way of colonialism, of expressing mm -hmm. Arabic colonialism, they are mm -hmm. not actually Arabic dialects. And the reason why is like, I mean, uh, North African dialects or uh, varieties of languages are not mutually intelligible by Egyptian. You're not going to understand the Moroccan, yes, mean. No Unless way. Pay so much attention, yeah. and the speaker has to slow down. Yeah, and Moroccan is very difficult change to understand. Change some of their lexical terms yeah. and their enunciation pronunciation and pronunciation mm. do a lot of work for you to understand the Moroccan or mm -hmm. Indonesian or mm -hmm. an Algerian, mm -hmm. all right? Because we speak true. different varieties, yeah. different yeah. varieties, highly influenced by other languages. Yes, Arabic donated to these languages, but not only Arabic. Let's not mm -hmm. erase this fact. Mm -hmm. However, under the Arabization policy and, and planning, this fact has been totally erased from our narratives and discourses and schools. And, and this is so bad. That's what hurt us most as North Africans. Yeah, 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 yeah 100%. Um, so I'm going to open it up. I know that there's probably a lot of people that have a lot of things that they want to say to Wafa or to ask her. Um, so please use the little uh, hand raise symbol there so that I know and then um, we can, you can just unmute yourself and start asking Wafa your questions. There is a lot going on in the chat. So um, uh, I'll try it at, at some points in there to, to try and, and bring some of those questions out, but I'm, let me see if I can find some here. So somebody, uh, Ahmed is talking about Arabic being a, a Semitic language. Somebody else is talking about the Muslim conquest of India. Um, colonization. Yeah, the genocide of India. Genocide, yeah. The yeah. genocide history that nobody speaks about. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, at least we're admitting like the, the, the thing is that we're talking about these days, it's all about reconciliation. It's all about talking, you know, about our past and admitting our past sins and, and things like that. But, um, you know, like when you talk about the Tunisian and Moroccan language, it also has French in there, too, because you're colonized by French and nobody is contesting that. Everybody talks about that. Everybody pushes back against that. Everybody is still, um, you know, they have a lot of opinions about that. But nobody wants to talk about the fact that you were colonized by Arabs. Like, that's the thing that can't be, you know, it's the sacred cow. It's the discussion that yeah. can't be had. And that's what makes it infuriating because yeah. you feel like you're being dismissed and ignored. And this is a yeah. huge part of history. And, and they did it in so many countries around the world. I mean, I said 50 because I was only talking about the ones they were successful in. But India is another example, too, of, um, you know, a country where they tried their hardest, you know. Yeah. And, and they're still doing this today. I mean, in Afghanistan, they were still blowing up Buddhas, which are part of the, uh, it's the Afghan history. But yeah. anyway, we'll get to the, uh, we'll get to the, the questions. Uh, Erkan. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Wafab, for, um, for another Thank great, you. another great talk, um, and thanks for allowing me to kick things off. Um, I just, I, um, I want to come back to the point about well, the two connected points I want to, uh, I want to make. Um, it's encouraging to hear about some because some of us, some of us are kind of blindsided by cultural, um, you know, obstacles, and we. we unlike Yasmin and others maybe like can read Arabic and can access news from you know other parts of the world social media sites and that kind of thing so some of us who don't have that kind of access are obviously blindsided by those um, obstacles so it's great to hear that you know other parts of the world are giving atheism a try or thinking about atheism and thinking about secularism and that kind of thing um that's not to say that's not to say of course that these regimes these countries that they live on that don't have their own you know countermeasures that they you know they try to intimidate people they try to censor things on the internet and so on like we mentioned last week but it's just good to hear that this these kind of conversations have been had and then um, one thing i wanted to say is that um you know while that's you know while that's good um I think that what's important is that whatever, if if any, whatever replaces religion, quote unquote, if that's even possible, if that even ever happens, I think what 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 needs to happen is um, is that it was something that religion gives people that maybe secularism doesn't so successfully is that kind of groupiness and that kind of sense of togetherness and. Uh, community as Yasmin said and this is also this is one of the things one of the sociological aspects that makes religion so interesting to me um, as someone who trained in sociology and um, is that that community can be it can be a, it can be a crutch and it can be also it can be like a prison and it can be it can be the source of kind of um danger and um, and you know and um um, violence and things like that and oppression so it, it can work both ways but one thing that wh whatever like I say whatever we, one of the things about secularization is things that people say is that it doesn't provide that kind of community that spirit that groupiness that religions do so that's the first thing to say and um, I'm not an advocate of religion I'm not an atheist but and um, that's just one thing to say and the other thing is about um and so, yeah, one thing that one thing that really brings that out is what we've seen with this kind of woke movement. I think that you know um, people, but to me, what what um, to me, it's not the because what happens is that those on the religious right will say, "Oh, this is what happens when you lose faith, right? Everything goes crazy." Well, to me, this is like based on something I'm writing at the moment. But to me, it's not about the abandonment of faith. It's the abandonment of reason that causes people to go sort of crazy. I mean, and that's not to say that, I, you know, I'm not talking about we should, you know, um, we should, uh, you know, we should believe in scientism and say that science is the answer for everything. But I think if, if religion, 
with, with, with the decline of religion, what I think, what I think needs to happen is, um, as, as Wafab was saying about critical thinking, that needs to be kind of rethought and kind of retaught in schools and teaching kids how to, how to have conversations and how to think critically and, um, and, and, and assess everything, always ask questions. The kind of the, the, the principles of liberal science as um, Jonathan Rausch would, would, would call it. These are the things that are missing, I think, not faith. I think it's, to me personally, I don't know what other people think about this, but I think this is what's missing. Um, and the other thing I would say is about- Hold Yasmin's on, hold on, Erkam, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> You're, sorry, sorry. It's too me. many things. If you want Abufa to respond to you, you can't, because that's just, you're on to the second thing. If you go on to the third thing, she's going to forget. I know I've already okay. forgot the okay. first sorry, thing. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just give her a moment to, to respond to what you've said. Okay, yeah, sorry about thank that. You. That's okay. Thank you, Erica, and thank you so much for, the, for those comments and questions. I mean, uh, uh, you are right about the first point on secularism. However, I mean, uh, what people are afraid of is not, is um, I think what's missing is an understanding of what secularism stands for. So people are afraid of what's propagated, uh, promulgated to them, you know, rather than understanding what is it about. I mean, if you go to any religious person and you uh, demand or lay out or ask for secularism or talk about secularism, the pushback comes basically from the fact, oh, you want to close my mosque. Oh, you mm -hmm. want me to, you want to prevent me from, from praying. Uh, oh, you want to prevent Muslim women from hijab. That's what you're doing. You do, you know, do like French. But actually, that's not. I mean, even in French, I mean, France, they are there is a misunderstanding of what's going on right uh, there. So that's uh, so, and unfortunately, uh, like you said, uh, that needs to be delivered to people since the beginning from scratch, uh, since an early age, probably in school and education, uh, to introduce people to what is that system, what's the system of secularism. I mean, depending on the subjects they're dealing with, that's. Lacking. So as far as Tunisia is concerned, for instance, Tunisia, I mean, everybody calls it a secular country. I've never seen it as a secular country, by the way, despite all the law, the laws mm -hmm. that are in favor and of, um, for women, for instance. And despite that, I live in a pretty liberal, a liberal state where, uh, I mean, I mean, we're pretty liberal, except that there is no freedom of speech. All right. So I don't really see it a secular country, but at the same time, there is one thing and one, mm, um, one uh, drawback about it, it, the Tunisian system before the revolution, which was deemed secular and everybody pushed against it after the revolution with the coming up of Islam, is, uh, Islamism or the Islamist power, is that it was imposed on the people um, from the top. It was not internalized. All right. So these were governmental decisions. Then a feminist or the uh, women's rights, they were not acquired um, following, for instance, the feminist activism. No, mm. they were decided by the government. So everything came top down and not bottom up. What we need to work on in those countries is a, a think about or set up a bottom up system where everybody starts from scratch thinking and raising questions about or understanding what is secularism exactly. But nowadays, um, I mean, even when in these uh, the big discussions that are happening in Clubhouse, like I said, these are big, big discussions. I mean, everybody will say, no, I don't want secularism because it's going to ban me from practicing practice in my religion, but that's not what it is. Everybody is, is understanding it this way. I mean, this is how they approach it. This is how the government or, or the, the regimes in Muslim majority countries introduce it to people, but that's not what's, what is it. I think and developing a good understanding uh, of what is it is what is lacking. It's lacking in literature, lacking in education, and of course, it's not encouraged at all by the government. So, uh, I mean, even when it is executed, it's executed top down um, and people don't want people to be aware of what's happening, just like abide by the government's re re religions, uh, sorry, decisions, even if th those decisions are in their favor. But uh, we spent like 50 years in our lives as Tunisians, plenty of the legislatives were in favor of women, for instance, but as the moment we breathed freedom, everybody was like about to collapse because People did not, I mean, people felt like mm, my Muslim identity has been like um, 
uh, kind of crossed off, and now I have to reconcile with that, regardless of whether you're male or female. And that was a big, big issue, uh, for instance. So that's that's for uh, secularism. But as far as people need a faith and need a sense of a community that's provided to them by religion, this is known. Yes, so it's not a problem of faith. However, I mean, uh, critical thinking does. Uh, in my, and I think this is my opinion, my two cents. I think critical thinking is growing. I mean, if you allow it as an, uh, and teach it as a skill, is not. In, I mean, sooner or later, it's gonna hurt the the, the religious um, system because I mean, if you're gonna start thinking, particularly in Islam, I'm not I'm not sure about other <laughs> religions. I mean, to be honest, but if you're gonna start thinking critically about Islam, that means you are gonna disalign yourself from that ideology. I mean, that those mm -hmm. are like the and for the uh, inevitable consequence, you, you're gonna mm -hmm. go away. <laughs> Uh, but if, sorry, if I, I know you're probably in the middle of a point, but if I can just respond to that. One of the things, um, one of the things that is an obstacle to that, though, is this counter accusation that science is an ideology, you know, like, and OK, yes, we can, we can make the mistake of falling into a kind of scientism, right? I accept that. But one of the things, even straightforward scientists like Richard Dawkins is is, is re he's regarded as a kind of ideologue, right? You know, and uh, there's a lot of damage being done in the social sciences and in literary studies and this kind of thing. Paul Feyerabend, uh, Thomas Kuhn, these kinds of people who've written about science as an ideology. So that conversation is already tainted, is what I'm saying. And, and I think that, you know, um, um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I, um, I think the antidote to religion is critical thinking. Um, and I'm not saying that, that's the, that, that, that um, science is the only domain in which that can take place either, but I'm just saying that critical thinking and liberal science, as Jonathan Rauch would, would refer to it, is the way forward, I think. No matter, in the end, whatever you believe, openness and debate and critical thinking and the ability to question everything is is the key right i mean that's what i'm saying that's right and what i noticed which i mentioned in my uh, conversation earlier on Erkan, is that nowadays richard Dawkins is not taken for granted by uh, for instance arabic speaking atheists not like before it's not like before like everybody okay we have an alternative okay there is this book or there is richard Dawkins, and people like no nowadays even when they read rich rich and Dawkins, they read it with an open mind and with a lot of critical thinking which i've, I've started noticing very recently to be honest but I'm happy with it because at least, I mean, people are not taking everything for granted. Now they're learning the importance of how to reflect on things. And, and they're learning that skill, reflecting on things and not taking them, even if they're coming from a scientific domain. I mean, you're not gonna, I mean, nowadays, uh, like for instance, this, um, this, this new trend, this new movement, um, if you're gonna present any um, reference to them, they're gonna tell you it has to be a reviewed scientific a reviewed a journal, for instance, they're not, um, and it has has to be written in this language, in English, because we trust English more than any other language, given that the history and the ideologies that were like, uh, they came up with other languages, all right? So, uh, uh, no, there is an, an, an awareness, a coming up uh, awareness uh, of, of the importance of thinking uh, reflectively and not taking everything for granted, even if things present themselves as scientific. And that's what, what makes the change nowadays. I mean, it's not like, oh, we're, we're looking for an alternative and that's science. That's not how they are really approaching it nowadays. It is science, but it has to be science, like really science. It's not like just because this is a public figure, I'm gonna follow them, or this person um, is claiming this is uh, something written in English and it's scientific, we're gonna just read it, or we're gonna just accept it because uh, that, that, that does exist. No, the question, they, uh, I mean, there are even um, among these, some of the leaders nowadays um, in, in these uh, movements, I mean, they have very impressive blogs where they question everything. Everything is under question and the scrutiny, and that's what makes the change. But the moment you understand the importance of examining and scrutinizing things in a uh, scientific method, in a scientific way, I mean, no matter how we're gonna um, stay, I mean, no matter how we're gonna understand that religious is important as faith for some people, you'll end up uh, probably taking a distance from it. Particularly, again, particularly Islam. Particularly when you understand Islamic teachings. That that's uh, that's I mean what I mean.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you with that. All right, uh, Trisha, you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to find out um, what you thought about, um, I don't know if it's Arab, Middle East, North Africa, or Muslims, how they value, the value they put on individual rights. As I see it, or I've learned it, that Western countries or where you have a democracy, individual rights are valued. And so uh, an outcome of that is that you have laws enshrining equality for minorities in particular. And um, from what I've learned, you don't have that in that region because there's, you don't have any equal right laws. You have no protection of equal rights anywhere in the region from what I understand outside of Israel. But um, from what I understand, that grows out of not placing a value on individual rights. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes, but you're right about that. I mean, that was a common hindrance among all Muslim majority countries. I mean, we think in the sense of community, the sense of the Amen, of the Ummah, or the uh, community. It's a pretty, uh, I mean, I may call it like a pretty a tribal approach uh, to rights rather than individual approach to rights, to, to human rights. Uh, but, uh, I mean, as far as uh, North African countries are concerned, uh, nowadays there is the change is upcoming, I think, particularly with, I mean, with activism and social media. Everybody is aware of the importance of individual liberties and individual rights, and everybody is like subscribing uh, to the, um, uh, uh, the uh, International Human Rights uh, uh, Convention, right? Uh, and they're trying to, I mean, uh, to use that as a uh, the main constitution, because not all constitutions, uh, I mean, this, they are in favor of a human rights. As far as the Tunisian constitution, by the way, and this is not a chauvinistic thing, and you may be like surprised, it's a very good, particularly the 2014, the new constitution, uh, when it comes to individual rights, it's very supportive of in, in, individual liberties and individual freedoms and individual rights. Um, however, uh, like everything uh, kind of like gets uh, I mean, you helped me with the translation. Yes, me just like uh, uh, not not uh, like everything in inside the body of the constitution is in favor of a human rights. However, it's like as if I mean, uh, it all loses its importance, its value because the first article of the constitution um, uh, asserts that the country is a Muslim country. So no matter, so it's kind of like very contradictory. So no matter, despite all the beauty, all the um, uh, progress, progress or the progressiveness that's in the body of the constitution when it comes to individual rights, it's kind of like everything is not going to be executed unless that first article is moved out of the way. But that as long as the first article states that the country is Muslim or the state is Muslim, and um, it's as if like uh, nothing is valid, all right? We're going to need a lot of work to pro before we could, we uh, were able to execute, uh, I mean, uh, what the rest of the articles asserts, all right? Um, but no, there is there is a change. Uh, there is an awareness of the importance of thinking individually versus thinking with the mindset of a community of uh, tribalism. This is for sure. It did, it does exist nowadays. It's ongoing. Uh, what are the consequences? That depends on the regime's decision and governmental decisions. But the activism is there, the awareness is there, and again, social media is so supportive in that regard. Yeah, I mean, in Tunis we have Le, the Kulib, which was about uh, to sign. I mean, like uh, 2016, we were about the government were about to uh, pass the bill for equal inheritance between male and 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 women, and by passing that bill of equal inheritance. Uh, all the Islamic laws are put aside. That's it. That's the last nail in the coffin of Islam. However, it did not pass because of some uh, political uh, corruption that occurred at that time. Um, where, where the equal of inheritance came from, came from uh, a committee that met, led by female uh, or feminist, uh, feminist activist, um, and they uh, insisted on the importance of individual rights. Uh, that's, it actually, I mean, even the, the committee's name is, is the uh, Committee of Individual uh, Liberties and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and Equality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, to say that um, some countries, like, I guess, uh, disagreed with the UN Human Rights Declaration. And so yeah. there is the Cairo Declaration. And it's, it's similar to what you were saying there, like, you know, you're, you're speaking out from 
it, it's it's double speak. It's very Orwellian, right? You, so you can't you can't say that we are all Muslim <laughs> and then and then talk about individual liberties or like before when you're talking about they have all sorts of freedoms, but there's no freedom of speech, which is like so fundamental. So there's there's a lot of that going on. I think that if we get rid of this group think, this tribal thinking, if I never thought of myself as an individual when I was a Muslim ever. And then even not just as a Muslim, but just as a woman too, and all of the honor shit that is piled on you, the family, the pressure, um, you always think of yourself as being pulled in a million different directions and having to um, fulfill all of these obligations for all of these other things, for other people, for other beings in the sky, for political things, uh, whatever it is, but you never think about yourself. What do I want? Who am I even? What are my desires? What are my needs? I mean, in, in my, in my um, interview with Ayan on her podcast, we were talking about how when we were forced into the marriages that we were forced into, our families thought of us as a thing, as a commodity, right? This is a virgin that I will give you, right? Mm -hmm. And we think of ourselves, we used to think of ourselves in that same way. Like I didn't, I never thought of myself as an individual human being. So that's definitely something that um, needs mm -hmm. to be overcome. And I'm really happy to hear that, that these kinds of things are, are happening. And I really yep. liked your example about how they're even being critical of Richard Dawkins because it shows exactly that, you know, it shows that they're even, it's not a new Quran, <laughs> you yeah. know, you're not just jumping, you, nothing is, there are no holy cows, we're actually gonna look at everything critically. Um, yeah. And, and the change in the, in the constitutions, I mean, like I said, uh, the basic demand, a common thread demand right now is to change the first articles of all these uh, constitutions among Arab-speaking countries, which states that the states are Muslims. Uh, so that's one basic demand. Once we remove that article, everything else can is going to flow. Yeah, in a better way and with more um, valuing more individual rights and whatsoever. I hope so. Um, so I wanted to make sure there was nobody else that had any questions before we wrap things up. I know there are a lot of people in the chat with that. I hope you have a chance to scroll through it because there's a lot of love for you there. Um, you just got yeah. a couple of really long messages from Sahara, who was also one of my guests on um, Forgotten Feminists. And she's just, it's just all love about how beautiful and wonderful you are. Um, and another one from Aliyah, who was also a guest in the past. Um, and she wants to thank you for the very insightful conversation. And she's saying, I totally love bold and empowered women who can think for themselves. So thank you. Definitely thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and with that, was there something else that you wanted to talk about? Um, I just want to make sure that before I conclude things that yeah. I've given you an opportunity to speak about everything that you wanted to speak about, to say everything that you wanted to say. Yes. Yeah. I just want to reiterate that there is a very impressive and a progressive underground movement of Arabic speaking uh, atheists. And notice, they don't even call themselves Arabs. They call themselves Arabic speaking atheists mm -hmm. because they know they're aware that there are other elements, ethnic or racial or linguistic elements that speak to their identities and they're not only identified by Arabs. And those are, they go across Middle East, North Africa and Gulf countries, including people from the Gulf. And um, it's uh, ongoing uh, that there is this, uh, uh, the first international digital protest by Arabic speaking atheists on the 22nd of February, 2020. Uh, so please, please, sorry, support that protest, please. I mean, um, just tweet the hashtag. It will be highly appreciated, really. And all the information, I mean, if you click on the hashtag, you're gonna find tons of information about this protest and how it's been organized and structured and what are the, uh, the, the objectives of the, of the protest. And it's growing and we hope that it grows globally to include everyone. We wanna tell uh, 
the people all over the world, and particularly in Muslim majority countries, we are here, we do exist, we're part of uh, our countries, we're citizens, and we deserve to be treated equally, not like just sec second uh, citizen class, or uh, not just like, uh, um, uh, we don't need to be, um, I mean, in the closet anymore, we want to come up. We want to change and change things towards like uh, the, you know, what's good for our countries, for our nations and our people. We want secularism. We want science. We want to uh, teach um, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, evolutionary theory, which is lacking in so many schools. Uh, it is high time we progress. It's high time we kept, we put up with the pro pro progressed countries. That's what th these are the main demands. And I just want to say that please support Inara, the first uh, religious association, legal associations in Muslim majority countries. And it is in Tunisia. Uh, uh, they're doing wonderful, wonderful work helping out the uh, people who are in the closet or who were like uh, ostracized by their families and uh, uh, people. And they are huge supportive of freedom of speech. We want to talk about who we are, our identities freely. We're all about freedom of speech and freedom of thinking, particularly. We want to mm -hmm. think freely and express ourselves uh, freely. And, and it's a, a growing uh, association, again, in which means enlightenment, I believe, in or enlightenment in in, in English, uh, and this location is uh, uh, in Tunisia. Um, and of course, uh, uh, I mean, uh, please support the translations project. Uh, we're uh, doing, trying to do wonderful work and reach out to as many speakers uh, of Urdu, Farsi, Indonesian, and Arabic in Muslim majority countries with secular literature. We not only translating Richard Dawkins' work. We're also open to other translations. As a matter of fact, uh, we are right now translating Yasmin's Muhammad book, Unveiled. It's been published in Urdu and Indonesian. Tonight is going to be published in Farsi. Oh. And uh, oh yeah, and uh, uh, by the end of February, uh, we got the first edited draft in Arabic and uh, hopefully by the end of February, we'll publish the final um, draft in, in Arabic. We'll also publish children's books written from secular mindsets by uh, the wonderful Ellen Bailey's Harris. Uh, the four mm. book series, yes. Uh, so we, we translated them in the four languages and we uh, published them. Uh, and we're open to all kinds of secular literature and we're trying to reach out uh, all these speakers in Muslim majority countries who are, and trust me on this, they are eager to see and mm -hmm. um, to read uh, different uh, literature, different books, uh, to get exposed uh, to different narratives and perspectives from the ones that sold to them or given to them by their own regimes, because they know that these regimes are not free and they cannot function outside the framework of uh, Islam teaching, being uh, under the influence of several religious, powerful religious institutions uh, like Al-Azhar in Egypt or uh, Dar al-Iftir in Saudi Arabia and those like they fund them money so money speaks here but the people are aware of that and they're eager to see alternatives and we are all that we're trying to do is help them out uh, or get accessibility to some of those alternatives by providing free downloading of whatever we translate on the translations uh, project and mm, publish that and reach out to them and tell them here it is another another way where you can see the world from a different perspective and understand the importance of fighting for your freedom of thinking and freedom of speech. Because that, these are like the most important, in my opinion at least, they're the most important um, uh, tools to humanity to think uh, to think as I mean um, from a humanitarian perspective to think that we're just human and always the humanity is always better than the text, whatever text, even scientific text. So let us be human. And, and one of the ways to reach out that 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 point, that 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 um, target uh, is um, to, to have an open mind and, and get exposed to everything and think uh, freely. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, so please uh, follow us on on uh, on the I'm going to uh, share the tweet of the translations project in the chat. If you don't mind, Yasmin. No, so, I don't uh, mind at all. Yeah. And, and yeah. also that hashtag was hashtag 22feb22. Right? Yes. So I'm going to put it in the chat as well. Okay. Can I just ask, if, is, if, is, is there any alternative to the hashtag? Because some of us are not on socials. I'm not on Twitter. So, I mean, I hate Twitter. So I, 
I've never even. I don't, okay, is, is there any alternative to following these kinds of things? Like yeah, I, I'll, 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 yes. So I will. Uh, I will send. Uh, I put in the chat the uh, the website of the um, of the protest. Uh, and you may follow uh, follow the website as well. And uh, uh, so, let me oh, see. you have a comment from Graham. Where Graham, she's already in academia. He says that you're going to be a. Um, uh, I just lost it because somebody wrote something and then it scrolled. Uh, if you go, you'll be a terrific teacher and professor. So you are a terrific teacher and professor. Yeah. And more love from Deborah, and more love from Sarah, more love from Manan. Thank and you, from Paula. <laughs> um, uh, Trisha is asking you about Inara. Is it spelled I N A R A? Which one? Inara. Yeah, yeah. This is how it's spelled. Uh in English and uh, I'll, I'll give you the website uh, now in, uh, in Arabic. Oh, okay. yeah. 22 Feb that's the press kit for the uh, for the protest wonderful thank you so much with that and thank, thank you. you. Did it show up on the thing for everyone? Uh, no. It's just a hashtag. Oh, okay. Let me. Uh, the press kit is uh, under the link that I just sent, but I am going to. Uh, one second, please. You know what? Just send it to me and I'm going to. I'll put it in the. Um, I'll put it in the description of this video because other people who are going to be watching this video are probably going to want that link as well. So just send it to yes. me afterwards. Okay. Yeah, All that right. sounds good. Great. So thank you again, Wafat. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your story and so much of your insight and so much of your knowledge about Mazir culture and, and everything else. And, and um, I really appreciate you sharing your time with us. And thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I hope to see you guys at the next Forgotten Feminist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmi, for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye, Heart. So much. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye, everyone. This talk. Bye.